Okay, so, so the topic of this talk is about uh, polynomial optimization and solving potentially large scale instances of polynomial optimization problems. So I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make uh, a few, uh, I'm gonna ask a few questions about who knows what. So who here never heard about polynomial optimization before? All right, okay. Uh, and, and so in particular, we'll see how to exploit the very specific structure of these problems uh, to, uh, to improve the scalability. So uh, in, my, in my course, I will talk about sparsity, but then later on this morning, you will see a talk on exploiting symmetries, which is a complementary uh, framework. So uh, first, what is that? What is a sparse polynomial optimization problem? Well, it's, uh, it's like a regular dense polynomial optimization problem. Um, so you have uh, an objective function, which is a polynomial with given coefficients. So f has known coefficients. And you also have polynomial inequality constraints. So everything is a polynomial. Uh, you have uh, inequalities. You can also have, of course, equalities. You can encode it with two, uh, two inequalities. And so the blue color is, stands for things that you know. So here we know the coefficients. Uh, but here we are in a special setting where everything is sparse. So what does it mean to be sparse? Well, we'll see that there are basically three kinds of sparsities that we will be able to exploit here. Uh, and so this is uh, basically a, a speed run course on what I'm gonna, the, the, whole, uh, the whole talk. So the first kind of sparsity is correlative sparsity. So here we, we really work at the level of the variables. So um, we're gonna see if, if there are many, uh, many products between one given variable and the others. And so this is uh, one of the easiest examples of correlative sparsity that you can think about. Um, because here, so you have, a, you have a sum of quadratic terms and each variable is connected to the next one and to the previous one at most. So the associated graph is a chain graph. And so here, for instance, x1 doesn't see directly x3, x4, and so on. Uh, note that here, if you would have x1 power 10 times x2, then it would be exactly uh, the same pattern. So the powers of x1 and x2 doesn't count but only the fact that they are multiplied to each other. The second kind of sparsity, maybe you, you are more used to it, or you already saw that in, in other applications, either in computer algebra or, or other, other fields, is basically when you have a few terms, a few possible terms out of the possibly many uh, terms. So let's come back to x1, x2. So x1, x2, if they are multiplied, then uh, you don't have any correlative sparsity in x1, x2, of course. And so this is an example of polynomials, which is term sparse, but which is not correlatively sparse. So the degree is 101, and you only have two terms out of possibly uh, many. And the last kind of sparsity is something that we recently developed. So it's called ideal sparsity. And here we're really gonna work at the level of the constraints. So we're gonna have simple, um, Cancellation constraints like this, so a product of two variables being uh, zero, and we'll see how to exploit that as well to reduce the dimensionality of the of the resulting approximations. And so I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna try to give some uh, some hints about about uh, the accuracy of, of this approximation versus the performance. So basically, when you exploit sparsity, you're gonna be able to compute very quickly some some approximation of the problem but uh, some relaxations might be conservative. So we'll, uh, we'll try to illustrate the trade-off between this, uh, these two. And um, we'll see that, for instance, the first correlative and second term sparsity are always conservative. Uh, and the last one is never conservative. It's the opposite. So it's quite, uh, it's quite strange, but this relaxation is actually always more accurate than the dense relaxation. Um, but of course, then you can have some performance uh, issues depending on the size, um, depending on the sparsity uh, structure. So any questions on that? Oh, it means that the value of, of the relaxation in the dense case will be always higher than the value of the sparse one. And if you are lucky, they will be the same. Any other questions? Okay, and then of course there is the question, why? Why should I be interested in that? 
Well, because sparse polynomial problems are everywhere, of course. Um, so they are, they are in deep learning. Um, so why? Because when you solve, when you model this robustness certification of deep networks as optimization problems, then you have all these connections between the neurons, but um, all the neurons are not connected to each other. And then you can exploit the sparsity structure. Um, power systems, and in particular the alternative current optimal power flow, are very sparse and very large scale polynomial optimization problems. So why? Because basically this laptop is not connected in the European electrical network to the fridge, to a fridge in Poland. So you have, you have a network with generators, but not all of them are connected. And also quantum systems. So in particular, uh, Bell inequalities arising from uh, entanglement uh, considerations. Um, so here again, you have two parties and you do measurements on the two parties and all the variables connected to Alice are not, um, uh, do not see uh, directly each other and same for Bob. So there is a lot of correlative sparsity in, this, uh, in these systems and I will try to illustrate this uh, later on. All right, so uh, before, of course, before uh, starting to talk about sparse polynomial optimization, I will talk about dense polynomial optimization. So this is in general a very hard problem. Uh, the objective function and also the constraints are, uh, can be non-convex. It's NP-hard in general to solve this problem. So what people do first is that they reformulate the problem. So at the beginning you have um, a problem which is in a finite dimensional space defined by this set of constraints. So basically it's a subset of Rn and it's non-linear. So what you do first is that you recast it as um, an infinite dimensional problem but, uh, but a linear one. Okay, so the, here what the formulation that you see on the left, I just rewrote the problem by saying that it's equivalent to optimize over all the integrals of f with respect to a measure uh, which, is, uh, which has to be a probability measure. So why? Because if you take mu to be the direct uh, measure uh, at an optimizer, then uh, you, get, you get the minimal uh, value of f and the opposite direction is, is quite easy to prove. And then by duality, you have a, a problem involving um, non-negative continuous functions. So here it's a non-negative polynomial, f minus lambda. But it's useless to do that if you are interested in practical things, because here you just, just reformulated things. And then when you actually want to try to solve this problem or to approximate it, you relax it. Okay, so you, uh, you either relax it in the primal or you strengthen uh, this non-negativity condition in the dual. So I'm gonna explain a bit more after how it works, but this is the high level idea. So instead of trying to optimize over all probability measures, which is too hard, you, uh, you somehow you discretize the measure. So you only take a finite number of moments for this measure. So what is a moment? It's the integral of a monomial. And when you're gonna, when you're gonna solve this, uh, these relaxations, uh, you want these uh, variables to be moments of a measure. So maybe at the first levels of the approximations they won't be, but at the end you want it ultimately to be it. And maybe something which is more intuitive, if, if you never heard about these things, is to strengthen this non-negativity condition so instead of saying that f minus lambda is non-negative, you're gonna say, okay, f minus lambda is a sum of squares. And the sum of squares is always non-negative, then it certifies that f minus lambda is non-negative. And when you fix the degree of this sum of squares, or you consider a finite number uh, of uh, moment variables, then you have a finite dimensional problem, which is convex, and in fact, it is an SDP, a semi-definite program. So I will recall what SDP is also after. And so a very nice property of this, uh, of this hierarchy is that when you increase the level of, uh, of the hierarchy, so when you increase the degree of the sum of squares, then you get tighter and tighter approximation and under milled assumptions, slightly stronger than compactness, you get convergence. So at the end of this staircase, there is F min, okay? But very often, you can't go to the second or third stair in practical applications. So that's why we need um, alternatives. 
So the size of the problems, the size of the matrices that you have in the approximations, they grow like the number of terms, the number of possible terms. Um, so very, uh, very quickly it becomes uh, intractable. So this is what we call the no free length rule. And we'll see how to overcome this in specific scenarios. So any questions on that? On the hierarchy? Okay, so if not, I will, um, I will give you an example. Um, so again, maybe you, you, you have all uh, much background in algebra, so I'm gonna give you an example uh, on, the, on the dual SOS side, but later on there will be also examples on the primal side. So this is the problem I want to solve in general. My set of constraints is a basic closed semi-algebraic set. Um, so this is an example. So here I want to optimize f over the unit cube. So each variable lies between zero and one. So this you can model it in many ways, but this is one example of, uh, of modeling. So here I just say that uh, xi times one, one minus xi is non-negative. Then I'm gonna do something uh, quite, uh, quite stupid. I'm gonna optimize x1, x2 on the cube. So what is the minimum of x1, x2 on the unit cube? It is zero, right? because x, uh, x1 is, is greater than zero and also x2. And then I'm gonna apply the hierarchy to this problem. And to apply the hierarchy, what do I want to do? I want to write x1, x2 as a scalar, minus one eight, plus a weighted combination of sums of squares. So here you have a first, uh, you have a first square here, which is alone, which has degree two, and here you have two other squares, which are of degree zero, and they are multiplied by the polynomials which uh, define the constraints. So this guy is degree two, this guy is degree zero. The, other, the, the whole decomposition has degree two, and, and then I have minus one eight. So what does it mean? So this is non-negative always. This is non-negative on the cube by definition of the cube. Uh, and this is also non-negative. So everything is non-negative except minus one eight, and x one x two is greater than minus one eight. Okay, so it's it's an approximation from below of zero, right? And, and then let's say that you are not happy with this approximation. Then what you can do is that instead of looking for a sigma zero of degree two, you're going to try to find a sigma zero of degree four, and you're going to actually optimize over all possible sigma zeros of degree four. And same here, uh, sigma one of degree two and sigma two of degree two. And by increasing the degree, you will get tighter and tighter approximation of zeros and, and eventually you will converge to zero at infinity. So this is a stupid example, but just to illustrate how it works in practice. So any question on this example? Yes? No, you don't converge in finite, uh, in finite number of steps. So the mathematical objects are, uh, I use here are uh, the count of sums of squares and elements of the quadratic module generated by the GJs, okay? So this is a big name to say that just take linear combinations of SOS and GJ, yeah? Uh, yeah, so I will, I, will, I will talk about that uh, later. It's still an open problem. So there was some kind of uh, big advance uh, in the, during the PhD of Lorenzo Baldi, which, uh, which proved the polynomial degree bounds for, for these for this multipliers in general. So polynomial in the, in the input degrees. And before the best rates were exponential. And we are also working on, on the, the, the sparse variant of that. But the theory tells you that it's bad. Yes. And here on this example, it says that uh, well, the point you are realizing is zero, there are no boundaries, so it's a little bit complicated. Yes, yes. And is it the reason why we have this? Uh, basically, yes. Yeah. This, this example is particularly bad, actually. No more questions? Okay. So. 
And so here, here is how, he, how it formally uh, works on the primal and on the dual side. So here I, I still work in uh, infinite dimensional space. So here I have my measure formulation and here I have my formulation as, um, so in, uh, in, uh, in the infinite dimensional quadratic module. So here I replace the condition f minus lambda non-negative by f minus lambda in the quadratic module. So I am allowed to do that if x is contained in the ball and there is a ball constraint describing my constraints. So in general, this is, this is not equivalent to this. But when x is compact and I have a ball constraint, then I am allowed to do that. And so you'll see that it many, in, in many practical applications, this is the case. I have the explicit ball constraints in my, uh, in my data. And so the hierarchy is to, uh, to approximate that. So this is the truncation of the quadratic module I just showed you in the example. And here in the primal, what we see up here are uh, moments and localizing matrices. So it's a bit technical, but I think for this course, I have to write the definition of the, of the moment matrix. Some people don't like to call them moment matrix because the Y doesn't always come from a, from a measure, so maybe I will call them pseudo moment matrices to, uh, to please them. Um, so I'm gonna give you a, an example. So, so in general, the monomial X alpha is just the powers of X i's power something. So in particular, for n equal two, I have x alpha equal x1 alpha one, x2 alpha two. And then I'm gonna take a sequence y indexed by nn. And I'm gonna linearize what is nonlinear. So I'm gonna associate a pseudo moment variable y alpha to each monomial x alpha. And the moment matrix of a certain order, so for instance two, is a matrix which is indexed by all possible terms of degree up to two. So it is, I took this 2D example to simplify the thing. And same here. Can you see or is it too small? It's too dark, and it's not straight also. So, yes. So here I'm gonna put y0, 0, here I'm gonna put y1, 0, y0, 1, y2, 0, and so on. Uh, éclairage tableau. Ah. Is it better? <laughs> no. <laughs> Maybe I should write it there. It's gonna. <laughs> Juste un peu, hein. Faut pas que ça... Okay. And so on. Okay, so to get to get a row colon element, I multiply the indices, and then I apply this linear functional Ly. So I basically linearize every one. So this matrix in the univariate case, it is a Henkel matrix. Uh, and so it's, uh, the pseudo moment matrices are basically multivariate Henkel matrices. So generalization of, of the univariate uh, case. Okay. And the localizing uh, matrices, well, it's the same, but 
So I'm going to have one matrix that I'm going to associate to each constraint. And to build the matrix, what I will do is that I'm going to multiply again x alpha and x beta, but then I'm also going to multiply by g. So I'm going to apply, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to obtain this, uh, this linear combination of, uh, of uh, y alpha. Because if you, if, you, if you say that, okay, g is the sum of g gamma x gamma, then this guy is just the sum of g gamma y alpha plus beta plus gamma. So in, in the usual talks about polynomial optimization, people never write this because it's, it's ugly, but here I have a bit more time, so I do it, okay? And so these conditions about, uh, maybe we can show here, yeah, thank you. So th these conditions about uh, saying that the, the matrix, the matrices, um, are, these matrices have non-negative eigenvalues, it is, uh, they are necessary if you want Y to come from a measure. Okay, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to prove that today, but so this is a valid relaxation because every measure uh, should have a moment sequence which, uh, which satisfies uh, this. Any question on this moment and localizing stuff? Yeah, it means, so it's the success, the success, so it means that the matrix has non-negative eigenvalues. So it's uh, semi-definite positive, positive semi-definite. Okay, and so th here are these matrices, they, they, are, uh, they have entries which are affine with respect to the Y alpha. So, so th this, this is a valid semi-definite problem at the end. And so the, the big question is what are the primal dual sparse variants? Then I'm going to show you how to derive the sparse version of that and the sparse version of that for the different uh, types of sparsities. Okay, and first I'm going to I'm going to start with matrices with sparse semi-definite uh, matrices. This might be a topic that you already uh, saw somewhere. Um, so let's start with with matrices. Let's start simple. So we'll consider symmetric matrices which are indexed by the vertices of graphs. So uh, let's take an example. So here I'm, I'm going to really show you some trivial things that you might already know, but just in case I, I want to recall them. So, so here, if, if my matrix is indexed by this graph, it means that the one three entry is zero. So here this entry is zero, and by symmetry this one also is zero. Okay. Um, and then I'm gonna we, we're going to see that we need the notion of cycles and, and chordal graphs. So the cycle, well, it's, it's a graph like this. And a chord is an edge between two non-consecutive vertices. And very often we will have some, some cycles in our graphs and we will want to make them chordal. So what is a chordal graph? Well, it's a graph where as soon as you have a four node cycle, you put a chord there. Okay, and it needs to be true for all cycles. I guess that there are no questions on that. And of course, a click is a fully connected subset of uh, vertices in a, in a graph. And basically, we will, we will want to, uh, to get these clicks um, easily and, and then to use these clicks to, uh, to obtain the primal dual sparse variants of uh, our hierarchies. Okay, so we'll consider uh, chordal extensions. So basically a chordal extension where well, you, uh, you add chords until the resulting graph is chordal. And of course you can always do that. So you just need to add edges. But it's not unique. So here for instance, I can put a chord here or here. And this is what we call approximately minimal or sometimes in the literature it's related to this minimal uh, fill-in. Uh, and of course there is the maximal chordal extension where basically you put some edges everywhere. So you have something, uh, a complete subgraph at the end. And 
then actually, if you succeed to do that, then you did the hardest in terms of knowing the clicks because the maximal clicks of a maximal chordal graph can be uh, easily, uh, easily uh, obtained. And uh, so it's a, it's a linear time in the, in the input data. Any questions on that? No? Okay, and, and then actually this, um, this cordality property, it is equivalent to, um, to a property uh, which is called the running intersection property and that we'll, we heavily rely on in our correlative sparsity algorithms. So yeah, it's, it's called RIP. Okay, so um, what does it say? So it says that I'm gonna take the union of everyone, all the successive subsets, then I'm gonna intersect with the next one. So this is why it's called running intersection because you, you run among the all possible union of subsets. And then it means it needs to be included in the first uh, union of subsets in one of them. So uh, it's, it looks also very barbaric like that, but in many problems, you have this property which holds already. So for instance, if you have two subsets, it's always true. So why is that? Because, because of this, right? Um, it's also always true for chains. So why is that? Because I have one, two, union two, three, union blah, 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 union k, k plus one. So I do the union of that. So I have the k plus one first integers and then I intersect with k plus one, k plus two. So I get k plus one, and k plus one is included here. Okay? So it's always true. For all? Uh, yes, there are cases where it's not true. So if you take a cycle, it's not true. You, you need to have a chordal graph. And it's, it's really equivalent to have a chordal graph or to have this. I mean, you need to do some reordering potentially. But. And it holds for numerous applications. So there is another application. Uh, there are other applications where you will have this pattern. So you will have basically I1, which is equal to, um, it will correspond to uh, x1, x2, x3, and another variable E1. So same here. So of course you need to be, you need to index, but I'm, I don't want to be too confusing. So if you have this pattern, then the running intersection property is also true. Why? Because if you do the union, you get all the x and a certain number of eis. And if you do the intersection with the next one, you don't have any more eis. So you get just the x size, and the x size are contained in all the predecessors. And so this is true for all the Bell inequalities that, that you find in, in quantum physics. And this is also true in another application that I will show you about Ronda Ferrars. So, if you have a problem and, and uh, there are subsets satisfying that, you immediately see that you have the running intersection property and then you can apply this, uh, this sparsity exploitation uh, technique. Okay, so um, I need to define what semi-definite program is. Who never heard about that before? All right, wow, okay, okay. So it's a generalization of linear programming. So your objective function is a linear function, and instead of having linear uh, inequalities, um, or equalities, 
Here you have linear matrix inequalities. So it, it must be linear in the, in the unknown variables. And here, uh, this success again means that the difference has non-negative eigenvalues. And in linear programming, you have polyhedron for the feasible set, and here you have spectrohedron. So we want to solve this more efficiently at first. And so there is this, this very nice theorem that tells you that if you have a big SDP problem with sparsity, then it's equivalent to um, several small um, uh, SDP problems. So the way it works, you need at the beginning to have uh, cordiality or running intersection property. So here for the simplicity, uh, I took only two subsets so that running intersection property always holds. And I have a matrix which is indexed by a graph, satisfying the, which is, which is cordial. And then this uh, theorem tells me that if Q, it's the same for Q to have non-negative eigenvalues and to be equal to a sum of two uh, matrices um, which have um, smaller dense blocks and which are also uh, SDP, okay? So for instance, this guy here is, is sparse in the sense that uh, this entry is zero and this entry is zero. Then I can decompose it as a sum of two blocks where uh, the only non-zero entries uh, correspond to one, two, and the second to two, three. So this theorem tells me that, and then there is a dual version of this theorem which corresponds to uh, SDP matrix completion, uh, but I'm, I'm not gonna show that. Any question on this Agler theorem? And so basically all the stuff we are doing are very similar to that. It, it's not exactly that, but it corresponds to that in the spirit. And so one, one thing about sparse SDP that is not true also in our, in our setting of, of polynomial optimization is that if you optimize over sparse matrices and you apply this thing, you get the same bound. You get the same value, but it's, it won't be true for polynomial optimization anymore. So that's why in the case of polynomials, it's conservative, and here it's not. Here you get the same. And then, yeah, I put some details for those who are uh, interested about how you, got, how you get this, uh, this inflating uh, matrices here. It's, uh, it's not so interesting. Okay, there are no questions on that. Um, let me continue. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna go from matrices to, uh, to polynomials and, and start with correlative sparsity. So it's the case where there are a few links between variables in terms of products. So what I, what I said at the very beginning. So when you have a polynomial optimization problem, you will build the graph corresponding to that. So it means that every variable you will associate a node. So here there are six variables, so I have six nodes. And then what you do is that you draw an edge as soon as you have a product. So for instance, there is no edge between x3 and x4 because the product x3, x4 does not appear in, uh, in F. So basically, uh, this guy is, uh, is almost alone. And so you build, uh, you build this graph and then you check if it, if it is cordial. If it's not cordial, you make it cordial. Uh, okay, I wanted to say that later. And uh, yeah, so you do, uh, you do similar things with, uh, with the constraints. So here for simplicity, I didn't put that, but you do the same. So you look at all the products uh, in the constraints G, and then you will, uh, you will basically add more edges if, if there are more connections in the DJs. Okay, so, so for instance, here is this guy uh, is not cordial. So why, why isn't it cordial? Yes, yes, so the square cycle, so it's a bit tricky because here we have the, the, at the beginning we can have the feeling that these two guys are connected, but they are not connected, right? So yeah, so you, you can make it cordial either by adding the nudge, the, um, the edge three five, or also the edge uh, six two. Huh? Um, and then you compute the clicks. So here, um, maximum clicks, there is one of size two, and there are two of size four. Um, and then what you notice is that your objective polynomial is a sum of three uh, polynomials. 
involving only subsets of variables. And so this is, this is uh, something that you can also do even if you don't have maximal clicks, but then the whole framework will be uh, some kind of uh, heuristics. And now what we're gonna do is that we're gonna index everything with these clicks. Yes? Okay. Um, and so, in order to obtain something which converges to the minimum of f, we need to be able to represent positive polynomials. So in the dense case, the way we represent positive polynomials is we rely on this uh, Poutinard uh, representation theorem. So it's called a positive shell and that. So one way to state it is that if x contains a ball constraint, then um, you can write a positive polynomial as a linear combination of um, sums of squares and the polynomials defining the constraint. So what does it mean to have a, to have a ball constraint, maybe here? So x will be basically some non-convex, ugly thing like that. But in most applications, this is compact. And then the ball constraint is, is here and has radius n. And then you just assume that one of the constraints is is a ball constraint. Okay? So in this case, you can always represent positive polynomials like that. And then in your optimization problem, you replace the non-negativity constraint by, by this. And so then what's, what's cool is that you have exactly the same in the sparse case. So except that now, uh, of course, we will need more indices because, because we have all these subsets. So instead of having a representation like that, you have a sum of them, yes? Stupid question about uh, this ball constraint. Can, yes. I, can I put another norm than the Euclidean norm? Well, if, yeah, if, if you can represent things with, with um, uh, with polynomials first, yes. And then if you can prove that the, the related Archimedean, uh, uh, the related quadratic module is Archimedean, then yes, you can. But yeah, most of the, most of the norms will work. But for instance, the, the one norm, I mean, you can somehow put it as well and represent it later on with polynomials, but it's too big. But in general, people use the Euclidean norm. The Euclidean norm, yeah. Or yeah. sometimes the four norm. Okay. Okay, so the, the sparse representation is the same, but then you will, we will basically have a sum of such certificates, and each summons will only see variables from one subset. Okay? So regarding the assumptions. So of course you need positivity. Uh, you need F to be uh, written as a sum of, uh, of terms, only seeing uh, different variables. You need the running intersection property or cordiality of the, the correlative sparsity pattern graph. And you need ball constraints for each um, subset of variables. But if you have this, then uh, you, you have it for any subset of, uh, of X1 up to Xn, right? Yes? Is there a ball constraint like on a screen? So yes. 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 yes, but you have all of them. And very often in applications, so for instance, in quantum applications, you have this. Projectors or unitaries. Then everything is already in the, in the problem formulation. So you have no problem with respect to that, um, theoretically. You can have problems numerically, of course. So any question on this sparse Putina? Yes. Oh, yes, I forgot to say that. So this JK, it's the set of constraints that see variables in IK. Okay. 
Um, so the first key message I wanted to give today is this one. So sums of squares do preserve sparsity. Because sometimes in some, some talks you hear people saying, yeah, sums of squares are not very friends with sparsity, but this is wrong. They, they do preserve sparsity. And very often it actually, uh, it actually happened that you try to solve your polynomial optimization problem with the dense formulation. And then the solver gives you the, the sums of squares and then you look at it and you say, oh, but it's very sparse. But I didn't, I didn't um, try my sparsity thing yet, but, but the solver gives me a sparse thing. Then you say, oh yeah, actually I, yeah, now I see it because these variables are not connected to each other. So actually sometimes the solver itself, even in the dense case, does exploit sparsity. So there is really a connection between, between sums of squares and, and sparsity. And of course, it's also true in the dual. This is what we'll, we will see now. Um, but so every course should include a proof. So I will try to give, to highlight the proof of this sparse Poutinar. And you'll see it's kind of, it's kind of very basic actually. You just need Stone Weierstrass and the running intersection property. Um, so yeah, so the assumption is that X is compact. There is a ball constraint. Um, uh, F is a sum of uh, polynomials, only seeing variables in each subset. And then what you're gonna do, so it relates to what I forgot to uh, define before. So for each subset, you take all the constraints that, that relate to this subset, okay? So you, you define some kind of subset of constraints that it's a lower dimensional space because here, for instance, you can, you can have only x1 and x2 and in the second one, x2 and x3. Um, and then, so what's gonna happen is that, so f1, f, if f is equal to f1 plus f2, f1 is not necessarily positive on x1, and f2 is not necessarily positive on x2. So there can be some cancellation, right? It's actually very easy to build some f1 and f2 which, which uh, do not satisfy that. But there are other polynomials, h1 and h2, that are positive on this subset of constraints. And this you prove it with schon weierstrass So you first build the function which is not exactly a polynomial but which is a semi-algebraic function by looking at the intersection of the subset. And, and then you approximate it with positive polynomials with, with uh, schon weierstrass And note that this, this guy can have very small degree, but these guys can have huge degrees when you apply Stone Weierstrass. Right? I mean, you, you also can bound somehow that degrees with Lipschitz constants, but you can have an increase in degree when you go from here to here. So F1 and F2 uh, have degree two, for instance, but H1 and H2 can have degree 10. And then once you did that, well, you just apply Poutinard, so the dense Poutinard on each guy. And then you have this sum of, uh, of certificates. And then, so you do it for P equal two, and then you do an induction by using the running intersection property. So the, the advantage of this running intersection property is that at the end, you are included in only one subset of variable, and then you can apply the, the induction uh, assumption on, on it. Any questions on this proof of sparse Poutinar? No. Okay, and then we're gonna do the same work, but on the, uh, on the moment side. So for each subset, we're gonna, we're gonna build a submatrix of this matrix that only corresponds to, um, to the variables of IK. So let's do it for uh, initial F. So this is a six, uh, variable uh, polynomial. And if you remember, so the first subset, uh, there was only one and four inside. So then I'm gonna build my first order moment matrix. So this moment matrix will be indexed by one, x1, x4, and same here, one, x1, x4. So sorry, there are six indices, but this is a six uh, dimensional problem. So here the first index corresponds to x1, x2, and, and so on. 
And so here I multiply x1 by 1, so I have, I have x1. And this is the pseudo moment variable corresponding to x1. So here I have a 1 here because it's x4. And here I have 2 here because it's x1 square and so on. So instead of having a 7 by 7 matrix, I have a 3 by 3 matrix. Okay? And so this is for the first subset, and then I do the same for the second subset, the third subset, and so on. Is it clear? Okay. Uh, and then, of course, you do the same also for the localizing matrix. So you replace, uh, you replace the localizing matrix by the one which sees only variables in GJ. Okay. So at the end, what is the sparse hierarchy? So it's a different staircase than the dense one, where each relaxation here will involve sparse variants of this. And also, instead of having this dense Poutinard, you will have a sparse Poutinard. So it looks like that. So instead of having one big constraint on the, on the dense moment matrix, you have several constraints corresponding to uh, two subsets. And here you have the sparse Poutinard. So it's a sum of elements from different quadratic modules. And it converges because we have this representation of sparse positive polynomials as sum of sparse squares. Okay, um, and then of course we will see if it's worth doing that. So all this machinery with the different moment matrices and the sums of squares depending only on few variables. So we're going to say, OK, the maximal size of my subsets is tau. And um, so in the dense case here, no, so it's already the sparse case. So I have a p guys like that. So these p guys are of degree 2r and depend on tau variables instead of n. And here I, I, have, uh, I have m polynomials that correspond to a number of constraints. So the number of corresponding SDP variables is r power tau, r power tau, instead of r power n. So I basically replaced n by tau. So it's quite good, right? So I, I basically get rid of the get rid of the n and then. I, I, have, uh, I, have more, um, I have more multipliers uh, because I have to consider one multiplier for each subset. Okay, um, and then, so actually it's much more general than that. You can apply that to any optimization problem which is linear with respect to a measure. So polynomial optimization can be cast as a linear problem over measures, but there are many other problems that can be cast like that. And so we'll see how it works for the case of polynomial optimization, but you can also do that, for instance, to minimize rational functions. Um, so in the sparse setting, you take again this, this xk, so it's the subset of constraints that only see one of the subsets of variables, and then you do the same for the intersections. So why? Because being sparse doesn't mean that you have two completely different subsets, right? At some point, you need to look at the common intersection between these, uh, these two subsets, so basically the, the correlations. And then you define some measures on these subsets. So you have the big measure mu, which is supported on x, and then you will have one measure associated to each subset. And then you will also have measures supported on the intersections. So you have a lot of measures going around one for each subset and one for each intersection. And this is, uh, this is what the sparse uh, version looks like. So instead of integrating just f with respect to mu, you're going to integrate each term with respect to each measure on the set xk of the constraints that, that see uh, ik. And then you will put these marginal constraints so basically, it means that if you have an intersection, then the projections of the measures need to see, uh, need to be consistent on this common intersection. Um, so 
So you have here you have a 2D example with with the here the support of a measure. And when we're gonna work with marginals, we're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna consider the marginal on, on X1, and I'm gonna integrate here in this region of space of X1. And then it means that basically you will take some slices. And at every point of A, you're gonna integrate over all the points of, uh, of X2. Okay, so mu1 of one is really the same as the integration with respect to mu over all points. So if x2 in is big x2 and you have a, you have a product of uh, um, a product space, then you can define the marginal like that. And then you do the same with the intersections and so on. Yes, always. Um, no, I think each mu k. Loud enough. How does it work? It works. Okay. Uh, yes, I think I think each each probability each each measure should be a probability. Not always. No, not always. Okay. It will depend on it will depend on the applications. Okay. Yes, yes. You can have applications where the total mass is greater than one. I mean, so just because the connection with this measure problem and this math classical optimization problem, it yes. seems like uh, if you take mu equals zero, then of course the uh, the infimum is zero, and then it's not very interesting. Sure. Okay. But maybe. Okay. But sure, you're right. So, so here is this guy should have mass one, yeah. or at least it should have a positive mass, and then you can always normalize. Yeah. And when you do sparse, um, when you do the sparse uh, version, uh, it's not uh, it's not necessary. But of course, they should not be uh, zero. So they should also have positive masses. But then you can always normalize somehow and consider probability measures. Oh, you mean, sorry, you mean this formulation is not a direct translation of Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So FCS, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So FC, FCS is not is not always equal to F min. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, but uh, but if you have the running intersection property, then it is the case. Okay. <laughs> Thank so, you. So if you have running intersection property, then uh, sparse and dense are uh, are the same, uh, and uh, it's going to be a homework to to prove that. Um, so, uh, but I'll give you the hardest part of the proof. So, so actually here you are trying to solve some kind of completion problem. So you have only partial info, you have local info on each um, subset X1 and X2. You have the marginals on, on these subsets. Then you also know that the marginals on the intersections are consistent. And then what's going to happen is that completion will be possible when the running intersection property holds meaning that you can find uh, a big measure mu on the, the whole set of constraints with marginals corresponding to the ones that are given as a solution of this sparse problem. So if you have a solution of the dense problem, then it's quite easy to build a solution of the sparse one. You just take the projections of each measure on x1, x2, and so on. But the opposite is a bit tricky, and it works only uh, I mean, it works when, when you have the running intersection property. So if you don't have the running intersection property, then you can build counterexamples. So it, it means that at infinity, dense and sparse are the same, at infinity. And, any questions on that? Okay, maybe I lost you with this measure thing. Uh, but in any case, the, the, the thing to remember is that also optimizing over measures preserves sparsity. 
And you can always write sparse variants of major problems, yes? Thank you. You added a explicit ball constraint. Yes. And in this case, I think you have finite convergence, right? In the dense case. In the with dense case. hierarchy. In the dense case, generically, yes. Yeah. So is this also true for the sparse? It's it's a conjecture. It's unknown. Ah, okay. okay. I, yeah, I don't I don't know if I prefer to think it's true or not. <laughs> But yeah, in, in any case, you can always try to do this, this sparsity thing, even at the high level of optimizing over measures. Um, and then I don't know how much time I have. Yes, I have some time. So I can talk about uh, extractions and obtaining the, the actual minimizers of the problem. So, so far, I only talked about approximating the minimum. But you can also, with these hierarchy techniques, extract the solutions. So here, so it's going to be a technical slide, but I'm going to explain with words. And so what I'm going to explain, then you can try to remember. So, um, so the minimal relaxation order, it's what? It's, it's the number that corresponds to, uh, to the minimal uh, degree that you, uh, that you can take. So if you have uh, problems with polynomials of degree 4, then you have to take a minimal relaxation order of 2, because otherwise uh, you can't define things. And now let's say that so you solve you solve the first relaxation, the second one, the third one, and so on. And at some point you realize that the rank of this moment matrices stabilizes. So it means that you take you take your moment matrix here, and then you truncate it. So you take the, the sub matrix of it and you realize that they have the same rank. Then then it's win-win. So it's win-win because um, you can actually prove that the solution of the approximation is exact. So you found the minimum of f. And it's second win because you can actually extract the support of the corresponding measure. And the support of the corresponding measure is a set of points, uh, real points, that are the minimizers of your problem. So that's very strong theorem. Um, you want to have that in practice. There is absolutely no guarantee that, that you, have, you will have that in practice. And uh, yes, so this is, the, this is the, dense, the dense version. So this is the formal statement of the theorem. So basically, if you have this rank condition, then with only linear algebra techniques, you can retrieve everything and you can solve the infinite dimensional problem, the one over measures. OK? And the number of solutions you get is precisely the rank of this moment matrix. So there are, um, there are tools to do that in practice. So you can do that with, with GLOBT Poly 3. You can also do that with our, with our software. Um, that's just linear algebra, and it's not complicated. <laughs> yes? Uh, when you say that the measure is supported upon two points, yes. It's yes, it's, it's a discrete measure. There are also problems with absolutely continuous measures, but in this case, you, you can't do that because the matrix will always have positive eigenvalues, always full rank. In this case, you can do other stuff, but this is not the topic of today. Okay, and in the sparse case, we have, uh, we have a similar thing. So it relates a bit to the question of Tobias, right? Um, does it always happen generically? We, we don't know, I don't know. Um, so. So in, in the sparse case, basically, you do the same for each matrix, for each subset. So there are many notations, but you don't care so much about that. So here, the first equality tells you that you need to have this matrix to be flat, so with stabilizing rank, for i1, i2, i3, and so on. And you also need that. This is very strong condition. So this condition tells you that you take, so you take the intersection of the subsets, and then you take the corresponding submatrix, and then you check if it's rank one. So it's very strong. 
It means that basically uh, there is a unique uh, optimizer coordinate uh, in, uh, in the intersection of the two subsets. So why do we impose that? So it's quite, there is an intuition behind so basically, let's say that you do the extraction on I1 and I2. So I2 corresponds to X2, X3, and I1 corresponds to X1, X2. So you do the extraction here and here, and then you will take some candidates, some minimizer candidates, X1, X2, and X2, X3. But of course, you want the same X2, right? So you want things to be consistent. And this rank one condition tells you that they will be consistent, always. So actually you can replace this condition by something more, uh, more uh, less uh, restrictive. Uh, basically you need to check that this, this second coordinate uh, matches. And if you have different points, then you need to make some couplings, some, some weddings between the points. Okay, and, and then if you have that and you are super lucky and uh, you, uh, you actually solved uh, an infinite uh, dimensional problem with uh, a sparse finite dimensional relaxation. And uh, yes, so, uh, so here it's not completely correct. Actually, the number of points you, you need to multiply the, the product of the TIs. And yes, of course, since this assumption is extremely strong, then you can try that without running intersection property. So without cordiality. So if you feel very lucky today, you would just pick some random subsets and try this. And sometimes it works. <laughs> okay, so there are other applications um, of, this, um, um, of this measure programming, so for instance, just for you to know that it does exist, you can minimize rational functions as well. You can minimize some of uh, rational functions. So of course, if you know how to do it for one rational function, then you can put everything on the same denominator, but you don't want to do that because you're going to first destroy all the sparsity that could be there. And second, the degree will just blow up. Then the size of the relaxations will be ridiculously large. So, so actually, um, the first thing that they tried in this case is to apply a dense uh, formulation of a measure. So why, why is it dense? So actually here they do a lifting. They use one measure for each fraction. So mu1 for p1 over q1, mu2 for p2 over q2. Uh, but all these measures are supported on the initial set of constraints. So they, they are uh, uh, n-dimensional. So this is why we call it dense. And actually, you can do better than that. You can impose all these measures to only see the points from x size. So you don't need to, uh, to read uh, all the, the constraints and to understand all of it. But so the difference between dense and, and sparse is, is because here these measures, they, they see lower dimensional spaces. And here you retrieve this, this uh, consistency of, of marginals, which is, uh, which is mandatory to, uh, to get convergence. Uh, any questions on, on that before I, I talk about the last uh, application? Yes. This is a bit the same as here. So it's, it's really to ensure consistency when you work in the intersections of the two, of two subsets. Yes. Yes. Then you have several methods. So the yes. first thing is probably wrong decision, otherwise or the term would be wrong, is that you put the direct uh, for each new node a separated new node. No, no, you take you take the direct and then with a, with a, a scalar, which is equal to one divided by the value of the denominator at x star at the optimizer. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Now, if you take this earthly or equivalent problem, mm -hmm. uh, can you characterize what the new i will have on the Dirac? Uh, yes, so so here there will be also a Dirac, but scaled with one over the denominators. Yeah. And so uh, here, here I don't remember, but I guess it will be Dirac at, yes, it, there will be Dirac, uh, but uh, you know, supported on the lower dimensional spaces. So you will take the first coordinates of your optimizer and then you, I mean, you will take the I1 coordinates of your optimizer and so on. Yes. Yes. But I don't remember the formula exactly. Okay, but it's easy to find. Exactly. Very nice explanation. Yes, it's exactly that. Okay, so let me uh, let me show you now some some applications. So just just to try to um, convince you that it, it does work in practice, and most importantly, that sometimes in practice you don't have the choice. Um, I mean, if you want to use this, this polynomial optimization techniques, sometimes. Uh, you can't even launch the, the, the computation in the dense case. So this is something that I did, I started during my, my postdoc. Um, so here we, we wanted to, uh, to estimate round of errors. So the model we used was, was stupid. It's not the actual model which is used in, in computers, right? But it was just to, um, to have something uh, to, see, to see if it works in, in practice. So, so this is a very simple floating point error model where you associate a floating point uh, error for each operation. So one for this multiplication, uh, one for the addition, and one for this multiplication. So of course you know that better than me than you need less round of errors uh, than that in, in practice, especially for this operation. Uh, but in, in any case, so if you have a large number of operations in your, in your numerical program, then you will have a large number of error variables. And it's a nightmare from an optimization point of view because this guy lives in the set where basically you can decide that each xi is between zero and one when you run your, your computation. Uh, but the magnitude of the round of error variables depends on the precision of your, <laughs> of your machinery. So they are of completely different uh, magnitudes. Um, so what people do in practice is that they, they linearize with respect to the error. And then you hope that this magnitude is uh, small enough so that this term doesn't start to be uh, um, dominant or like close to the magnitude of L. Um, and then you do whatever you want with this guy just say, okay, it's zero. Oh, it's a small thing that, that is obtained with interval arithmetic. And then you spend some efforts to bond the, li the linear term. And now we, we, we retrieve some kind of optimization problem, which is where the subsets are like this. Because it's linear with respect to uh, E1, E2, E3. And then you have this subset, and then running intersection property holds. So even if you have a thousand EIs, you don't care. You will define a thousand subsets with X1, X2, X3, E1, and so on. And uh, you will have a thousand uh, uh, moment matrices, and so on. Yes. So you know about the E1, E2, for example, they will multiply each other, so it's not exactly as... Uh, yeah, but then you linearize, right? Ah, and okay. so the product so, yeah, E2, yeah. E3, you put it there, okay. and then you say, okay, it's very small, it's zero. Right? <laughs> oh, I mean, it's, you bond it with interval arithmetic and you hope that your, your cause bond will not, uh, will not get close to the magnitude of this L, right? Okay, so, so here it's good because at the beginning, maybe you have a thousand here on the exponent, and then, uh, Yes, no, sorry, so M is the number of uh, error variables. So maybe you have a thousand here, 
and then you, you put the thousand in front. Basically saves your life. So n, sorry, yeah, so n is the number of input variables. So here n is four, and m, m is three. But what happens in practice is that m becomes very big very quickly, and n stays, can stay reasonable. Let's see an example. So here n is six, and here I have 15 round-off error variables. And I am in double precision, so I know that the magnitude of this round of error variables is, is this. And then, so if you want to try it, then you can, but it will just make the laptop crash immediately. So you try the dense, the dense formulation, and then you have like 10,000 variables. And I mean, now, it's, now it should be okay, actually, for, for modern laptops, but at the time in 2015, it was not okay. So you get, you get out of memory, so you get kicked by the, by the laptop. And then if you do the sparse thing, then you get almost immediately the answer. It's, it's not the most accurate answer that you can get, but at least it is an answer. Okay, and then we compared with some kind of sophisticated uh, interval arithmetic, where I first did some uh, reduction of the polynomial, I wrote it in another basis. To get to get a small uh, smallest possible error with interval arithmetic, um, so yeah, so so this guy is less accurate than this guy. It's bigger, so you want something as as small as possible. You want to minimize the error. Yes. So what do you mean by the five thousand uh, becomes seven hundred fifty nine epsilon? Well, no, no, so so. So this is equal to this, yes. so 15 times the binomial number, mm -hmm. and sorry, this is the bound I obtain, the, the bound of uh, f minus f hat, ah. the, the global, uh, the total uh, round of error. Okay, to be compared with the inter interval arithmetic method exactly. that gives you another bound, uh, a worse bound. A worse bound, yeah, but okay. it's much faster. And yeah. then uh, we also tried some, uh, some competitors, so we tried with Taylor approximation, so Taylor approximation was better, in terms of accuracy, but was, uh, was uh, slower for, for this instance, and also some other SMT-based. But, so to be honest, it's very hard to beat these guys. So Taylor-based methods are extremely efficient in practice, but sometimes, sometimes it does better. So yeah, so the summary of this, uh, this small experiments, so we are here. So we are not the most accurate, but we are the fastest on this example. Then Taylor is here. Taylor is the more most expensive, but uh, it's the, the also the, the most accurate. And they are losers for this example. Not always. Yes. And do you think that a rough uh, explanation of why they they, uh, they have better bounds? Because as far as I remember. No, it depends. It depends on the number of subdivisions that you do. Okay. Because Taylor is based, of course, on. So Exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the only difference. Yeah, yeah. The only difference is when you do the work on this guy. Yeah. No, because no, because the sparse thing is conservative, right? Uh, but also the dense relaxation, right? The dense relaxation is not maybe not exact. Okay. If you take uh, order one, order two, and okay. yeah, so all discretization work at the level of the hierarchy. The discretization of Taylor works at the level of how many subdivisions you do. You can also yes, but usually they take degree one or degree two Taylor approximations. Huh? They just bond the Hessians with with uh, interval arithmetics and it's very hard to beat in practice, yes. Oh, because it, com it comes from the formalization of the Kepler conjecture. Okay. So it's uh, something that we cooked up with people from, uh, from yeah, who also worked on, on this formalization of Kepler's conjecture. It's uh, quite artificial actually. Okay, so yes, so um, 
to finish, I'm going to talk a bit about this, this quantum information problems. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm doing optimization. Uh, I'm not an expert in quantum info. I'm also not an expert in power systems and also not an expert in artificial intelligence. I don't. But I like these benchmarks because, uh, so for two reasons. So the first one is that in practice, well, they are very, uh, very good for, uh, to, to promote our, our techniques. And also, so usually you get exactly the same results, the same theoretical results, but the proofs are very different. And then when you are bored by one topic, then you can learn a bit of things on, the, on this other topic and, and try to get, try to prove them and to get the same results. So here I'm gonna optimize um, other variables, which can be uh, quite, uh, live in quite general spaces. So H is a Hilbert space. So pick your favorite Hilbert space. And V of H is the set of bounded operators on this Hilbert space. And then in non-commutative optimization, you're gonna optimize some quantities that look like our regular polynomials, but over all possible H's, so Hilbert spaces, and all possible bounded operators on this Hilbert spaces. So for instance, being positive on this space is extremely strong because you are not only positive on scalars, but you are also positive on matrix tuples and you are positive on this weird L2 Hilbert space and, and so on. Right. So in the non-commutative case, all positive polynomials are sums of squares. Um, and in the non-commutative case, so uh, uh, I want to reverse uh, things sometimes, so I take uh, the involution operation which reverses the world. So the involution of A1, B3 is B3, A1. And all my variables are, um, are supposed to be uh, self-adjoint. So, uh, so if you think about the matrix, it's just the transpose conjugate. Okay? So think about these guys are very big matrices. Okay? And then in non-commutative polynomial optimization problems, um, you have constraints. So here's these constraints really come from the physics. So they say that each, uh, each operator A or B is a projection. And also that all of the A's commute with the B's. So I have partial commutativity. So A1 doesn't commute with A2, but A1 commutes with B1. Okay? And then, um, so one, one sort of, uh, of non-commutative optimization technique is minimal eigenvalue optimization. So here I'm looking at um, the minimal value of this inner product. So V lives in a Hilbert space, uh, is a unitary vector. And then F of AB is an element of B of H. So I apply, uh, I apply uh, V to this, uh, to this bounded operator. I get something. So, so uh, this guy is also an element of H. And then I took the inner product between two elements of H. So is it clear the definition of the minimal eigenvalue? <coughs> it's a bit weird at the beginning because we, we live in this, uh, in this uh, Hilbert spaces and you, uh, we actually optimize over all Hilbert spaces. So it's not written explicitly here, but so it's, uh, you have a lot of constraints. But for us, this thing can be just rewritten like that. So as um, um, a linear problem with an infinite dimensional positivity constraint. So it really has the same flavor as our F minus lambda from, from before. Except that here it's a non-commutative polynomial. Okay, and then we have the same representation result for positive polynomials. So again, I need this ball constraint, but again, for applications, very often I have them. And then I have this, so if F is positive on X, then F is a sum of Hermitian squares. Yes? Ah, c'est bientôt fini. Okay. <laughs> mais mais j'ai bientôt fini, j'ai encore une minute. Je pense. Okay. Um, yeah, so F, F is, a, is a sum of Hermitian squares plus something which, which is a combination of the polynomials defining the constraints and Hermitian squares. Except that here you will take every constraint and you will multiply on one side and on the other side by the adjoint. 
So then I get the same thing as Lasser, the R key. So I replace the hard thing by something which is easier that I can compute with an SDP. Okay, and then so what happens is that at the beginning, since we have this very strong result that everything positive is a sum of squares, we thought it could be the same in the sparse case. So what does it mean in the sparse case? It means that you have a sum of sparse Hermitian squares. But of course it doesn't work. And uh, it's, uh, it's quite easy to build counter examples. And the, so here is this, this is a counter example where you don't have the, the rip, but there are also counter examples where you have the rip. And I will show you a, a, a computer example later on uh, tomorrow. But of course there is an analog of this sparse um, commutative representation. Uh, so the proof is quite, uh, it's quite hard. It has a, somehow s something similar to these marginals of measures, but with linear functionals. And so this is the result. So here you have a sum of helton makarov uh, representations, or uh, non-commutative Putinar representations. So it's exactly the same theorem as in the commutative case. So now let's see an example, and then I will finish. So this is an example with, um, uh, with uh, six non-commutative variables. So these examples, they come from Bell inequalities. So who never heard about Bell inequalities? Okay, so this is something that quantum uh, information theorists uh, like. So there is a guy who got, the, who got the, the Nobel Prize for his work on Bell inequality, for his practical implementation of Bell inequality, Alain Aspe, did you hear about that? So he worked on that, actually, he, he set up the experimental setting uh, for the violation of one of the, one of the simplest Bell inequalities. So I'm not gonna explain all the background of that, but so here what you need to know is that this quantity here, um, under these constraints, if you, if you have a classical, uh, if you take classical physics, it will have a maximal value, and now, if you work in the quantum physics setting, then the value will be even, uh, even uh, above. And so there is somehow a violation of this inequality when you go from classical to quantum setting. So actually, depending on the constraints that you have on these operators, you will get different values. So th this is what we, uh, what we, uh, what we mean by uh, maximum uh, violation level. And this is something that you can compute in practice. So here again, the subsets, they are exactly uh, similar to, uh, they are exactly the same as the one for Randolph error bounds. So you take all the guys, all the operators for Bob and one from Alice, and you do that for every, uh, every operator of Alice. And then we can do some computation. So then I'm gonna really show you the trade-off between, uh, between accuracy and performance. So here at the sparse level, we get something which is less good than the dense level. So why? Because here you want to maximize, so you want something as small as possible. And this is smaller than this. So instead of five, I have zero, okay? And so this is PAL and Vertesi. So already at the time they, they so, so this paper was published in 18, but they started this experiment much earlier. So what they did is that they say, okay, I'm gonna go to level two and then to level three. And then here you can see that the nine goes to eight, which is an improvement. Then it's already very expensive to compute this third order. And they were not able to compute order four. So they say, okay, I'm gonna take some random guys of degree four. So all the guys of degree three and the random set of degree four. And I'm gonna call that three prime, so 3.5. And then you get this bound so you can improve the sixth or seventh digit, and it takes one day to compute this bound. So the, the, the bound, the sparse bound is, is, is kind of crappy, but, but you can go to other level, to higher levels. And, and then you get better and better bounds. And then in one hour, you get almost the same bound. So this is a typical example where here, you can get the same accuracy, but, but in, in less time. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna end on that. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Victor. Are there any questions? Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, it's a, maybe a too general question, but uh, when your input problem is not sparse a priori, but for example, you said uh, that sometimes you can apply a solver and then it, it noticed that it was sparse. Is it possible to like maybe look for the sparsity just before applying your techniques? Or? Uh, yes, sure. So some people did that. Uh, of course, it's a kind of heuristics. But yes, you can do that iteratively. You can, you can be helped by the solver. You can also some, sometimes detect some symmetries thanks to that. So you, you see a block diagonal structure and you say, oh, OK, there, maybe there is some, some so symmetry exploitation to do. And so this kind of uh, symmetry or sparsity, uh, is it possible because uh, it seems that here it really comes from the application because by nature of the application. But can it happen like? Just randomly, or uh, what do you mean? So I if, mean if you don't, if you don't take an application, right? But in no, this I case, mean, some, some, some sorry, some sparsity which was not part of the application, or oh yes, definitely. Sometimes you can have uh, you can have discovery. Uh, also, symmetry. It's uh, you know, it's it's very hard problem to detect all the symmetries. So sometimes the solver can help you to do that definitely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? So, I, I have a small one. Yes. Uh, so, when you introduced uh, the non commutative case, I think you said that, uh, oh, uh, so you said that uh, positive, non negative polynomials are sum of squares? Yeah, actually, positive semi definite. Okay. Because, in some way, uh, if you if you only have, for instance, a one b one, as far as I understand, you fall back to the commutative case. Yes. So why do we have here uh, non-negative implies SOS? So I, I am missing something. Or? So your objective function is a one star. No, I, I, I'm just saying I only have two variables, so a one and b one. Yes. And now they commute according to your, uh, yes, to your assumptions. Yes, but A1, B1 is not uh, positive semi-definite. Ah. Okay. It, it works in the unconstrained case. Huh? Yes, but I, I can make a, a, a semi-definite positive. No, why? Well, you, you need to add something. So for instance, if you take A1, B1, B1, A1, mm -hmm. then you have a non-commutative polynomial, and this one is positive semi-definite. Okay. And in the constraint case, so in the constraint case, uh, you have, uh, where is it? Yes, you have a representation of uh, positive definite polynomials as combination of sums of squares. Okay. No other questions? Okay, so let's thank Victor again. Thank you.